David here with Fig Boot on Pens. Uh, today I have a pen from a company by the name of Danny Trio, and it is a very special and very unique pen. I know I say a lot of pens are special, but this one is truly, truly special. Um, Danny Trio is a company that's been around since the early 70s. And in the early days of the company, uh, they made uh, inexpensive pens as well as having some more expensive product lines. In the 1990s, however, they moved away from the inexpensive pen market to kind of focus more on uh, the high-end and artistic market, uh, using uh, mainly pens that were using uh, Urushi lacquer and Mackie techniques. Uh, and their pens are truly a work of art. Uh, and the price tags can reflect that uh, with pens that retail for as much as $35,000. Uh, they have some of the most unique lacquer pens I've ever seen. Uh, and they produce their pens in small runs. And so there's a limited number of retailers that uh, distribute their pens as well. So if you're interested in their pens, you have to work for it a bit, but it's well worth the trouble. Um, what I'm going to do today is go over the parts and features of this Danny Trio pen I have, talk about what I care for, what I don't care for, show some measurements, some size comparisons, and then provide a writing sample. Uh, the pen arrives in this sleeve and in this soft wood box. Uh, here you can see it says Danny Trio right here on the front, and inside we have nothing. Now, there's just a little piece of felt here in the front covering what's inside, which is the pen and a glass eyedropper. And here we have the Danny Trio Tammy Nuri on shoe on Genkai. Now, I know that name is a bit of a mouthful, but I'll break it down here in a minute to explain what it means. Um, First of all, this is an ebonite pen treated with Japanese Arushi lacquer. Now, just a little bit of info on Arushi lacquer and, and what that really means. Uh, you know, Arushi was first used in Japan over 3,000 years ago, uh, and Arushi lacquer is a natural material uh, obtained from the sap of the lacquer tree. Um, when the trunk of the tree is actually cut, uh, it produces a resin in an attempt to try to repair the wound. And this resin is called Arushi. Uh, and a single tree can only produce a few grams of resin each time that it's tapped. Uh, and since it's so scarce and so hard to obtain, the Arushi lacquer is very, very valuable. Um, our lacquer trees from different regions in Japan can produce different variations of Arushi, uh, and pigmentation is often added as well to obtain the desired color. So in regard to the pen itself, let me name that, uh, break that name down, but actually in reverse. Uh, Genkai is the model of the pen, uh, which is then covered in uh, Shu Arushi, uh, which is red in color. Then a technique is called that's called uh, Tame Nuri, and I'm probably butchering these Japanese names, but I'm just going to stick with it. Uh, Tame Nuri is uh, used to apply a semi-transparent uh, amber-colored uh, suki arushi. Uh, they do uh, make a manufactured, a, uh, they do manufacture a man-made uh, lacquer, uh, not for use on these pens, but uh, any man-made lacquer can be transparent, but there's no natural uh, arushi that is 100% transparent. Uh, even the clearest arushi still has a, a light brown or an amber color. So what's going to happen is that the colors will change as the arushi is applied. Uh, and that this arushi is special because it contains a layer of membrane uh, and that as the natural arushi matures, the outer layer will become more and more transparent and the underlying color will show through more. So over time, this pig should transition to um, a much brighter red than the darker red that it is right now, which I think is kind of cool. It kind of gives some life to the pen. Now, creating these pens is very time consuming and painstaking work where layer upon layer of lacquer is carefully applied. Uh, it takes so long, mainly because after each application, the pen needs to dry for days under specific humidity and temperature conditions. Uh, and the end result is a surface which has durability and luster, and as you can see here in the, uh, in the light, is just gorgeous. 
So let's actually take a closer look at the pen. Um, the pen is circular. And here at the end of the barrel, it is perfectly flat with some rounded edges. Uh, and that this is a clipless pen, as you can see. Uh, and the barrel is virtually straight. There's about a tenth of a millimeter difference from one end to the other. That might just literally be the lacquer that is applied on top of it. Uh, then there's a rounded step down to the barrel. And the barrel tapers down ever so slightly to the end. There's about a one millimeter difference from one end to the other. And then on the end of the barrel, it's again round and flat. One of my favorite things about this pen are the edges, which have been polished so you can see some of the uh, underlying redder Urushi. The cap twists off to reveal what very well be one of my favorite nibs in my collection. This is a beautiful number eight, 18 karat gold, two-tone nib that is just stunning. Now, I'm not certain what, certain what the symbol is or if it's of any significance. I know Danny Trio has another nib design, which is like a flaming wheel, which relates to symbols often painted on the back of Buddhist statues. But I was unable to find a specific meaning behind this design. Uh, it might be something similar, uh, but I love it. It's just exquisite. And here's a look at the low profile ebonite feed. Uh, the section actually tapers down slightly and then angles back up. Uh, there's a, a very slight step up to the cap threads, which I don't buy, find to be sharp at all. And then a much larger rounded sort of step up to the barrel. Uh, and while this is a, a very large pen, uh, I find the section to be very comfortable. Uh, the pen doesn't post. Uh, it would just be silly if it did. It's, uh, it would be a bit on the big side. Uh, but uh, I find it's, it's plenty long enough, no matter what your, the size of your hands. And I feel it's very balanced in your hand. And there's a certain warmth to ebonite pens that I really enjoy. You might have guessed it after seeing the glass eyedropper in the box, but this pen uses what they call an eyedropper shutoff filling system. Uh, in order to ink the pen, you actually physically remove the section, and then you use the eyedropper or syringe to fill up the ink reservoir. Um, the Ginkai has a very large ink capacity of 3.7 milliliters, which to show you an example is this much ink. So that's 3.7 milliliters. So you're talking about a lot of ink that is inside of this barrel. Um, after filling up the pen and replacing the section, uh, what you do is you unscrew the blind cap. There's a little blind cap that's on here that you just in, uh, unscrew, uh, which is attached to a rod, which seals off the section from the main reservoir. Uh, and so what this does is when you angle it down, it allows ink to flow into the section, and then you can screw the blind cap back down and then after using the pen for a while, the uh, ink in the section will be depleted and you'll need to untwist the blind cap to repeat the process. Um, if you have a, a Twisby VAX 700, uh, it works very similar in regard to uh, the secondary reservoir. One of my favorite things about this pen is the blind cap. As with most Danny Trio pens, the Nuri Shi, which is the Arushi lacquer artist, signs the barrel end of the pen in gold kanji lettering. Uh, the character in red is a traditional mark used by the artist to identify their work. Uh, this specific pen was made by a gentleman by the name of Koichiro Okazaki. I hope I'm getting that name right. Uh, and I believe he makes all of the Genkai models for Danny Trio. Um, they have different artists which make different models of pens in their line. Um, when the blind, blind cap is closed and you're holding the pen, uh, the mark is like on the side of the pen. Now, I don't know, it's probably just this specific pen, but uh, I kind of wish it was facing up so I could see it. Now, I've played around with the blind cap in the section to see if there was a different thread combination and wasn't able to, to do that. And I really didn't feel like messing around with the uh, the, the feed and the, the nib. But uh, what I do do is I make sure that when, uh, when, the, when I'm opening the blind cap uh, that I orient it so I can see it. I just think it's kind of cool. I like to see the marks. You know, I, I've heard it said that the job of a craftsman is different than just producing one good item. You know, it's being able to produce a high quality item over and over again. In the process improvement world, we call that repeatability and reproducibility. You know, while I only have one pen, I can't attest to how well Mr. Okazaki uh, is able to repeat his process and reproduce a high quality pen, but from the sample size of one that I have in my hand, 
I am extremely impressed by his work and his craftsmanship. Uh, and I love that a person is tied to this pen. You know, a person held this in their hands over a period of several months to create something unique and special. There's just some care that went into that, and I like that. This pen is very expensive. Um, other than my first class classic pens, LB5, uh, this is the most expensive pen that I uh, have in my collection. Um, it originally retailed for $1,800, but I was able to get it on sale for $1,200. And is it worth that price? I, I would say yes, but really understand that at that price, you are buying something other than a pen. You are pur purchasing a, a handcrafted piece of art, uh, and and the pricing at that can be can fluctuate a bit as far as what you feel is worthwhile. You know, I really like that at first glance, uh, this pen isn't very flashy. You know, if you knew nothing about pens at first glance, you wouldn't think that this pen is anything special uh, other than being huge. Um, you know, there's a stylish minimalism that I really love about this pen. And as we'll see in the writing sample, uh, the nib is spectacular. And it is just the perfect combination of craftsmanship and performance. So there is the Danny Trio Tommy Nuri on shoe on Genkai. So now I'll show some measurements, some size comparisons, and then the aforementioned writing sample. So here we go with the Danny Trio Tommy Nuri on shoe on Genkai. Uh, you know, I'm just going to call it uh, Danny Trio Genkai going forward. Now, I will say that I am very protective of this pen. Uh, since it doesn't have a clip, uh, you can't just put it in your pocket. So I, I really wouldn't let it even leave the house until I picked up one of these Takia Kimono pen wraps. Now, I don't think that this warrants a full review, but I will say that I, I do like it very much. It, it fits this enormous pen just fine, and I really like the pattern. I think the wrap really complements the pen well. So let's actually take it out for the size comparisons. It just slips right out. So in regard to some size comparisons, here it is with a Classic Pens LB5. Then here it is with a Pelican M1000. And then here it is with a Mont Blanc 149. And you can see that even though these other pens are, are very large, that it kind of towers over them. This is a, a very large pen. And then in regard to some other pens, we have a Visconti Homo Sapiens. And then we have a uh, Omas Ojiva Cocktail. And then just to be silly, here it is with a Caveco Sport. So you can just see that there's a little bit of difference there. So we have the Danny Trio And like I said, I'm just going to call it the Genkai going forward because that's the, the model of the pen. And this is a medium nib. Uh, and this ink is Bung Box Piano Mahogany. And this is what it looks like. Uh, that, you know, I've been into brown inks lately, and that, uh, you know, I've grown very fond of this ink very quickly. Uh, you know, here's what it looks like in comparison to uh, Mont Blanc Toffee Brown, or even uh, it's very close to something like the Faber Castell Hazelnut Brown. But it's uh, very nice. This is what the bottle looks like. Uh, again, fantastic ink and uh, the Sailor bottles leave something to be desired, especially for a uh, pen like this. Now, this one's an eyedropper, but you're not getting a number eight nib uh, in here and actually successfully getting any ink out. So now in regard to the rest of the writing sample, Uh, 
uh, that this nib is just spectacular. It, it really is one of my favorite that I own. Um, you can get a bit of line variation out of here without trying too hard. Uh, that just putting very little pressure and then adding a little bit more, you can see that you can get quite a bit out of there. Um, that it's incredibly smooth with just a little bit of feedback, just a hint. Uh, and I really find this pen to act more like a Western medium as opposed to a Japanese medium. It, it's really incredible. And in regard to wetness, it's a fairly wet nib, as you can tell. And then in regard to reverse writing, It's very, very smooth. That might be the smoothest reverse writing uh, that I, I've had in any of my pens. That, that's, that reverse writing is actually smoother than some pens I own uh, writing the, uh, in the traditional fashion. And in regard to fast writing, the feed has no problem keeping up whatsoever. So, the Danny Trio Ginkai is truly a wonderful pen. Uh, yes, it is very expensive, uh, but I have not regretted purchasing this pen whatsoever. Um, that if you're looking for a high-end pen that um, has some uh, spectacular craftsmanship and artisanship, then I would definitely look into the uh, Danny Trio line, and they have a number of items that, that might fit what you're looking for. So thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you later.